to welcome to my podcast channel. I think I know you from our picket line. We mm -hmm. are both activists, but you are much bigger activists than me. So I was oh, trying to find out a couple of things about you. And you were involved in lots of things like anti-nuclear protest. I'll be really, really interested about you know those early, earlier memories. But before that, just like a couple of obligatory questions might be like, where, where were you born there? I'm from Glasgow. I was born in um, Rob Royston, and the site of my birth is now a giant Asda. <laughs> so it's, uh, I sometimes like to think, I, I sometimes wonder exactly which part of the great consumer world I was born in, you know, whether I was born in the freezer department or, mm. you know, in amongst the dog foods, who knows? Because I actually never thought that you were from Glasgow. <laughs> because well, I mean, yeah. I mean, I think your accent is a bit different than the, I don't know. Like, what do you think? Can you give me some oh, idea how it works? <laughs> I I don't know. I, I'm not sure. I mean, I think I'm from, I think I've got a, a, West, a West Coast. I think I've maybe got a more West Coast accent because it, hmm. it sort of goes up and down a bit. Because I think the East Coast of Scotland, the accent is very flat and it goes, it's on one note, you know. Mm. But I think in the yeah, I think maybe it is a more West Coast accent than it is. Yeah, because I mean, people have asked me if I'm Irish before. Yeah, well, I, I guess we moved around a lot, but uh, no. When I was, you know, we grew up in Glasgow. Then I lived in Cumbernauld, which is the modernist new town just outside Glasgow. Mm. Then we moved to Edinburgh, which I didn't like very much. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you know, it's you know, outdoor education saved my life really because I oh. used to go climbing and we used to go caving. I mean, we used to go on really serious caving exhibitions in our last year at school. I mean, I don't think health and safety would allow you to even step in a, an easy cave these days. Mm. But mm. we were doing quite quite heavy. We, we we took part in a couple of cave rescues actually. That was extraordinary stuff. It was yeah, and so after that. You know, I went to be a student in Aberdeen for a while, but this was long before I became an artist. And that's when I actually got involved in any kind of politics, because about the second week I arrived, there was a big vote for um, to occupy the university um, administrative buildings because they wanted to, the university to disinvest from Barclays Bank who at the time were one of the biggest banks uh, involved in um, apartheid South Africa. And I mean, it wasn't just that they were doing banking in South Africa, they were involved in all kinds of stuff to do with, the, you know, buying the military equipment for South Africa. So this was a serious and, you know, in a sense, that was I was straight into that as much as any kind of education, mm -hmm. you know, kind of living in the university admin in a sleeping bag for the first few weeks of term. It was quite something. And they didn't get they didn't kind of they didn't give in as such but you know a couple of years later they began to disinvest but I, yeah. I don't think they could be seen to have been influenced I mean mm. it's quite mm. extraordinary now you know looking at Aberdeen University's principal now being extremely boneheaded as you know I think he's the, he's the head of the University Employers Association now and he's a it's quite odd Aberdeen has this kind of you know very mm. Very unpleasant at admin, but there's perfectly good people actually teach there. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that there's someone called Tim Ingold who wrote a lot about reclaiming the university by academics. And I think Aberdeen's a bit of a focus for a, mm -hmm. a tussle for the soul of the institution, if you like. Mm -hmm. so I think maybe we need that here a bit. Mm -hmm. You you covered quite a bit of timeline here. Well, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, okay, <laughs> big jumps. Uh, um, but I'm really interested about you know growing up in like Glasgow. I mean, what 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 are those earliest memories like? Any kind of even like small political consciousness? What is going on when you were growing up in Glasgow? Well, I went to primary school in Albert Drive, you know, on the south side now, and that's Pollock Shields East, mm. and you know that's that's well known as you know kind of quite a vibrant, mainly Asian area now, and in fact. The school, you know, that I went to, I can remember Asian kids getting the belt for being off school for, you know, various religious holidays. 
you know, it, it, and that, but it's it kind of at that age, it, it didn't it didn't seem particularly kind of you you, you can't quite make sense of it, you know. Mm. But at that point, you know, it, it was still it wasn't a very mixed area in the way that we would know it. I mean, for example. I mean, most of, most of the Asian families at that point were living down Maxwell Street, which mm. was really, really bad houses compared to, you know, Albert Drive and over Kenmere Street. I mean, Kenmere Street, now famous for the, the anti-home office, um, mm. you know, success. But mm. in, in a sense, it, it was quite, you know, a wall. And, you know, in school, you actually met, met meeting Asian kids and it was... It was a first, but you know, the first time I ever met the Asian kids was in school, and it, it seemed pretty. So I remember when we moved to Cumbernauld, one of the Asian kids, I can't remember his name, he gave me a a little toy Rangers, uh, you know, footballer, which <laughs> you know, and that doesn't fit with any of your normal kind <laughs> of conceptions, you know. Oh, no, that was, that was it was interesting, <laughs> but then come, I mean, Cumbernauld was kind of meant to be, you know, the modern solution to, you know, Glasgow's housing problems along with all the other new towns. But mm. I, can't, I don't, I, I don't, I can't think of any other city in world history that has tried to solve its problems by exporting its skilled working class, you know? Mm. Mm. It, it, it doesn't make any sense in anybody's terms what Glasgow did. And, you know, a lot of Glasgow's problems now are to do with mm. the mm. idea that, you know, that the, the centre is hollowed out. Mm. And you know, all the again the, the Tories kind of thought, oh wait a minute, Glasgow's exported its workers. Why don't we actually export the kind of mm. rate paying middle classes do? So now you know there's people in, in, in places around Glasgow, you know, the Bears Den mm. down to you know the nice bits of Renfrewshire, they don't actually pay to sustain Glasgow. And yet they benefit from its infrastructure. You know, it, it's it, and the, the, this was the Tories definitely trying to bring a left-wing cities, you know, under control. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, money, money's doing that. Yeah. And, you know, that, that was that was the, the, the strategy. Yeah. But, you know, you, Cumbernauld, I, I, I loved the idea of the modernity of it. Um, I went, but both of the schools I went to have since been demolished. <laughs> I seem to have left a trail of demolition behind me, you know, in, in some ways. But the, the primary school was right by the town centre, um, Seafire Primary. Um, the secondary school, Greenfalls, was we were the first class into this school, and it was incredibly new and fresh. Mm, mm. But in a sense, I suddenly you 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 move from Glasgow, which has you know you you met all sorts of people, and you met. But then Cumbernauld was a bit more of a monoculture, but you don't really realise that at the time. Mm, mm. You know, when you're a kid, you, you just you just suddenly see that, oh, God. And then you suddenly go, well, this isn't as modern as we thought. Here come the orange larges. You know, they'd, or, or, there, was an, or, there was an orange march around the ring road in Cumbernauld, and I thought, we're not leaving. This is not modern, you know. I, I knew enough to know. <laughs> and I just, uh, you know, I remember a friend of mine, you know, his dad had these records, and it was re orange marching bands, like rec you know LPs, and I just couldn't. I didn't know what this was actually, <laughs> and in fact, I, I didn't come across uh, the, the orange thing at all in Glasgow. But only when we moved to Cumbernauld, I actually came across it. And the idea that there was Catholic schools separate was, you know, how could I not have known that? But I, I didn't know that. It's mm. so all the things that you, you think now. How could I not have known that? I mean, but that that constitutes the <laughs> the ideological life around you, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. The way you kind of you know explained your earliest memories, like growing up in. Do you think that was very urban setting? Oh yeah, but mm. having said that, Glasgow always had fantastic parks, mm, mm. and a lot of mem a lot of mem memories are you know. Happy childhood, baking hot summers, you know. Mm, mm. Other memories are that we were living in an extremely cold basement, which was rather damp. And I, I've blotted out a lot of memories of having tonsillitis. And I had my tonsils out when I was, I um, can't remember what age exactly, but, mm. you know, it was, it was pretty hor pretty horrific. And I had a throat hemorrhage afterwards, you know, just after I got home. And I'm quite lucky to be here, really. Mm. 
Yeah, but anyway, everyone got their tonsils out in those days. <laughs> you know, it, it just seemed to be. I don't think we do it anymore. Mm-hmm. It's hard like, to imagine fashions in fashions in operations, but that, that seemed to yeah. be one. So when you were saying about you know your schools are no longer there, demolished. I mean, I mean, some well, Albert Drive's still there, but the Cumbernauld <laughs> ones, you know, the, the, oh. the secondary schools rebuilt, mm. but the primary primary is gone. Mm. No, gone. I think that's that's part of this like modernization, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. As an artist, what's your insight on that? Like, you know, it's it's like it's not only like demolition this that the school, but also history as well. Your memories, our memories. I think right there, there's some writers that are very good on this. You know, thinking about there's a, there's a really great writer, um, Jeff Torrington, who wrote about. When he worked in the um the Linwood Car Factory, it's mm. a bit called Swing Hammer Swing. It's very funny, and it's a bit it's a bit like a good soldier spec for you know mm. you know for the the south side of Glasgow really. Um, I remember a, a particular writer that I came across. I mean, I was, you know I came across him quite young for for coming across because the, the library in Cumbernauld was great. They they let you. Just read the adult section as much as the kids section from when you were about, you know, 13, 14. And I remember coming across J.G. Ballard, who's one mm. of those kind of dystopian. Well, he, he actually writes about the real world, you know, as as fiction. And mm. I, I felt that this strange world of concrete cars and, you know, sociopathic desires and advertising actually described pretty much the world that I was living in. Mm. I mean, my dad was a heavy drinker in, in a city that was supposedly so reliant on cars when he lost his mm. license. That was, I made mean, a huge difference. Mm. So, I mean, you know, he, he he pulled himself together eventually. I don't know how happy he was. Mm. Again, both my parents were brought up, you know, they were, they were, they were only children, not only semi brought up by, well, my mum wasn't brought up by her own parents and her dad. My dad was actually born in Royal Pindi. My my grandfather was an Indian Army engineer. Wow. So I got you know it it looks like you know he had this idyllic childhood, but I'm not really sure it was you know. Mm, mm. I mean you know, again you know this idea of that you know that they're all terribly all terribly posh these officers. I'm mm. not so sure of that. You know it was a way that you know people with skills who couldn't get, you know, where they wanted to. And, you know, Scotland's always exported its skilled people, you know, mm. whether it was Glasgow exporting them to Canada or whether it was <laughs> Scots going out to India, Ireland, Canada. I mean, I, I don't know much of my granddad spent time in Canada as well. Mm. Spent time, I mean, th- this is why, uh, you know, the, with the whole Brexit thing, I keep thinking about uh, who we are and, you know, how can I get a European passport? And of course, my granddad was in um, Ireland, but he was uh, fixing the trucks for uh, for the army. So that's not going to do me any good uh, <laughs> passport. That was that was a strange strange life, you know. You, mm. it's, I mean, my great grandfather was a gardener on mm. a, on a big bit of landed estate, and I guess my granddad didn't want to do that. Mm. Mm. So what? Where do you do, and where do you go? I was just talking with a, a a student about how, you know, family and migration and change. You know, there's um my sister got very interested in looking up, you know, who's who in the family and so on. And mm-hmm. they, she got there, there's people up, in, you know, from Caithness in about 1700, she got back to, you know. But then <laughs> she actually found there's an awful lot of Dunlops in the southern states of America. Mm. Mm. And there's there's a story to be told about how all these people, you know, mm. it's not and it's not the story you expect to hear about, you know, kind of poor hardy Scots working hard and you know, it's it's a story about you know exclo- exploited becoming the exploiters, you know, mm-hmm. some, of these, some of these Alabama Dunlops. I don't think my sister ever wants to hear or see them again, you know, <laughs> and I think there's good reason for that. The the way that, if you like. People going over with this kind of puritanical Church of Scotland kind of work ethic mutate mm. into these racialist Southern Baptists, you know, mm. who are Trump people, you know. 
Mm. You know, there's an interest, interesting stories about that. In fact, there's a writer, Fraser MacDonald, has written very interestingly about this. Mm. And, uh, I've just been talking to uh, a PhD student about this. Glasgow was quite divided as well in terms of sectary and politics. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned about those Orange March when you were growing up. Um, it's still going on. Yes, it's still, it's still going on. It's not as intense as it was, but mm. there are day, I remember, I, I, you know, after I, you know, had moved away from Glasgow, I, I, I realised that I was actually wearing green one day when I was on the south side of Glasgow, and there was going to be a, a, a big football match, Rangers versus Hearts, who are the two very <laughs> Protestant teams. And I, I, you know, I felt very nervous. And, oh you know, it's like down into small things in life, you know? Mm, mm. And, I mean, people get hurt. People get stabbed for yeah. no reason. You know, it's not improved. Mm. It's not It's it's not as many people, but the level of violence is still there, you know? I, I We lived on, you know, in a, quite a quiet bit of the south side of Glasgow, so I didn't really know much about any of this because mm. I don't think I ever saw any of these marches. You know, they didn't really... You know, they didn't march around our way, you know, but mm. but only later on, you know, when we actually moved to supposedly new town, mm. sort of became aware of it. Mm. It's a, like public, like visual presentation because mm. you, you are a visual artist. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I mean, did you think about this, like you know, when these kind of things happen? Like, I mean, how I and mean, why? They want this visual thing, you know, the drum, the flags, the color. Um, I mean, what's 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 going on there? I mean, why it needs that fanfare? Well, I think it is community, and the the, the world of the world of community is very double edged, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, it can be both limits and it can be, you know, kind of freedom, and in a sense, the origin of all that as community, it just indicates that there that there hasn't really been anything else. You mm. know, I mean, you go you go back to you know the days of the Orange Lodges in Glasgow, and you know the kind of all the guys with their white gloves and bowler hats, and it's actually that we are the respectable people. That there's a, a strange disguise of being respectable in the kind of you know the, the kind of formal Orange Lodge members. I'm not talking about the you know the people with the Rangers tops. With a, with a blue bag of carry out, you know, we're talking about the actual, you know, formal marchers. If you, they, they look very formally respectable in a mm. very nineteenth century way, and it is about that they they felt that their jobs were under threat from Irish people coming in. I mm. mean, Celtic and Rangers as football teams both started up as a result of. They actually both had a religious impulse in that they were, they were there was a great a lot of you know church in, in, you know help of setting these things up as something for people to do you know and I mean and football historians will know a great deal more about it than I but mm -hmm. in a sense that was a time that the conservatives actually had a huge working class vote in Scotland oh I mean this is not widely known mm. but you know. It's like, you know, we're talking, you know, 100 years ago, and really up until the 1950s, there was a huge conservative working class vote in Scotland. Oh, my God. Mm. I mean, nobody knows. You know, it's completely oh, no. forgotten, and it's it's quite surprising. Mm. Well, it's, it's surprising to us now, because mm. in, in a sense, the conservatives actually had this, they, they actually had this kind of twisted sense of, okay, this is community. These are our people, mm. you know? And, and and in fact, I, it's always they're, they're always very careful to call it the Conservative and Unionist Party in Scotland, or they used to be. They're not, they're, they don't really care anymore now. Mm, mm. But that, that's actually an important thing to realise that it was Conservatives versus Liberals for a very mm. long time, and a lot of the kind of histories that you know the left you know look at don't really go deep enough. I think to to think about these things. Mm. I mean. There's a couple of books that I, I find really interesting about Scotland by somebody called Kenneth Roy. Mm. And he was a journalist, and he, he, he used to be on Reporting Scotland when I was a kid. Mm. Um, and he wrote these two books about a kind of, if you like, a vernacular history of Scotland. 
Mm. You know, just built from newspapers, built from people's memories. It's a bit like the mm. David Kine Aston ones, which are, you know, mm. kind of more general British ones. But these are these are very built, you know, stories that build a personal picture of people's relation to Scotland. And I, I find these incredibly insightful. Mm. And, uh, you know, I'd recommend this to absolutely everybody. Thank you. Um, you are an artist. I mean, can, can you give us more insight about being an artist? Like, I mean, when, you know, that light bulb moment for you that you wanted to be an artist? Now, my folks decided that, you know, I was not to do art at school because it was not any use. So they made me do something. They said, you're going to do something useful. So they made me do Latin. <laughs> so, you know, that was, so <laughs> it kind of, that kind of stood on it for a while, but I was, mm. I went to Aberdeen and I did kind of, you know, a bit of social science, a bit of philosophy of English in the way that, you know, could do a general. Yeah. Degree. I frankly spent a lot of time interested in art history and I mm. used to write for the student paper and so on. But then it was actually later on, I started to put on concerts for CND, and I, you know, making the posters. So this was something interesting that, you know, you would you you would be making posters. So I, at least as interested in typography mm, mm. and does you know you know poster design as art. You know the actual art came a bit later on, and so mm. I got very interested in what's eye grabbing, and I I started doing silk screening, which I've completely forgotten how to do now. But, <laughs> you know, it was a uh, it, it was great, and and I put on quite a lot of music and then I moved to London to do it mm. with another group of people and I was living uh, I had a Polish girlfriend and so one day we um, got on the train to Warsaw for a few weeks and this was this was at the this was at the height of uh, General Jaroszelski's time oh my god <laughs> you know it was it was martial law and we were we were quite punk looking you know so it was quite strange, but there was there was that under undercover uh, 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 under the surface culture going on. There's a lot of, if you like, vegetarian anarchism under the surface. Yeah. And well, when I went there, a good friend of mine, Ka Choi, gave me a camera to take with me, and he said, "Here, take," because I didn't have one. And it was a Pentax KX, and I've still got it. Oh my God. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful old camera. It mm. doesn't work so well now, but it's <laughs> it, it's it, it, it's it, it had a few features on it that meant that you, you you know you could really understand what it was doing straight away. Mm. Mm. And so there there I was, and out in out in Poland, and and, and very quickly, you know, th th there was all these bizarre bits of of, of things going on that there was a. I mean, for example, there was a May Day march, uh, an official May Day march, you know, for you know, the, the, you know, a Communist Party May Day march, where basically the the television companies basically just looped the same people again and again. And, again. and <laughs> the is, there was this. It, it was extraordinary because everybody knew that everybody would know that this was being done, but. Every, they, they they still sort of had to make this march look big, so yeah. it was everyone was kind of a little, little wink. Yes, okay, here we go. <laughs> and then you know, the, 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 then the the, the 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 TV channel had to interview Communist Party members denying that this was happening while showing in the back. You know, there was this colossal make believe world going on. Mm. It wasn't all make believe. There was the the riot police, the Zomo, were very very brutal. Mm. And just round the corner from where um, uh, Anya's folks lived, there was a church, and uh, the priest, Yerji Perkusko, was beaten to death by two secret policemen one night. Oh, my God. And so it was... But then, you know, there are certain illusions that you have, and you think, oh, well, people are only going to the church because that's a place that they can meet, and they're not really that religious. But then when Poland did, you know, become, you know, independent, and suddenly all these religious parties and, you know, religious politics suddenly came out the deep freeze that they'd been in since the 1940s. And there was still the Peasants' Party, for goodness sake, you know, that suddenly appeared again as if it had never gone away. Mm. And, you know, the... the, the 
the idea that you know greater discourse and you know more communication is going to lead to more freedom is one of the the great sad disillusions. I mean, the internet's really put paid to that idea. So mm. how do we how do we actually get to a stage of you know intel you know intelligent discourse rather than you mm. know kind of hatred? You know, it's it is extraordinary. Mm. When I got back from there, though, I was really really interested in. You know what do you how how do you show ideas and change and you do the same as everybody you know you take a lot of pictures that I got some lovely photographs of CND demonstrations and you know punks filling the fountains in Trafalgar Square and sitting in but then you think okay it's like that whole Brechtian thing isn't it that mm. change isn't just here's a picture of a demonstration it's more about how does how does what goes on in in in, in people's mm. hearts relate to change. Mm. And so I began to think about different kinds of ways of thinking about mm. image and change. Mm. And in, in a sense, some of the answer in, in, in the last few years has been to think about what what was the what were the infrastructures produced during periods of optimism, and can we learn anything about optimism and change and possibility from looking at these places? Mm. So there's also, you know, the, the the mirror image of that. What kind of infrastructures come out of fear and, you know, kind of, you know, deterrence and mm. militarization? And when you actually look at those two things, you actually discover that they're not actually very far apart at all. Mm. So that, that's that's essentially what I've been uh, I've been trying to do as a, as an artist. I mean, I was I, I very much saw myself as a photographer for a very long time. I don't really mm. see myself as a, photo as a photographer anymore. I mm. I make I make moving image works mostly, but I, mm. I do all sorts of stuff. Mm. Yes, mm. I think it's I think it's really important to. You've got a couple of large things that you're trying to shove along that are like the huge stones that you're trying mm. to push towards happening, and then suddenly they're happening and you can't think about anything else. But while you're pushing those huge stones, you need to have some small things. <laughs> are quite playful and quite fun mm. to to be working on, and occasionally the small things become that huge thing. Mm. Mm. I mean, I made I made this little I I I made I made a, a couple of music performance pieces with it with a friend, and we took uh, you know Kraftwerk, the kind of technological German band. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. They, they they they've done this very very interesting and very ambiguous song called Europe Endless. And it's it's all it's it's about you know here is Europe it's this kind of strange dreamlike culture and it's you know something that we belong to and and yeah but they 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 play it with 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 great they play it very straight and you you don't really know if this is something they actually believe in or or, or don't you know but what what I did was I was really interested in playing this with a community of people. Mm parts of Europe so I came across one of our one of our best uh, students was actually a mature student who was actually actually a, a bell ringer and one mm. was just one one day she brought in some handbells and was playing them in the college and me and me and my friend Eddie thought god this is brilliant so we just joined in and you know there was something very joyous mm. about you know Joy playing Sound. music where you don't quite know what you're doing. You mm. see, oh, okay, that's the beat. Every time you see a square with that color, you ring that that bell. And starting from there, I thought, I wonder if we could do a version of this thing for handbells. And eventually, we got a whole gang of students and staff together working on this. My daughter was involved as well. Mm. Mm. Of course, we got just as stage we're just about to be ready to perform and play this and record it. Then the whole lockdowns happened. And so and after that, um, we had to start again because a lot of the students had moved on. So it took much longer than expected. Mm. And indeed, at the moment, you know, culturally, it's quite hard to get stuff out there. So I'm very pleased that it's going to be showing in uh, November, a big show in Edinburgh. Mm. So that's quite exciting. But the idea that you you have this community based around some practice is actually what's exciting to me about art now mm, mm. I, used to th I used to naively think that if, if only people saw the right images it would sort of change their minds on things 
participating in art if you want to be yeah. in politics you're you're you're, you're in politics really mm, mm. and if you want to be in social change art art may suggest and involve community in some ways mm. it might mm. suggest it might it might point you can show people social change or you can that you you, you know people to actually feel that they can be involved in it is mm, mm. that's that's the big problem nowadays oh well, what's your take on how <laughs> to, how do people actually feel that they can yeah. have any agency? Uh, like I mean, I, I'm quite inspired by. Um, do you know this English poet called Samuel Taylor Coleridge? Uh huh. So ancient mariner's rhyme. Yeah, yeah. Remember that. So the his role is he has to tell the story again and again, wherever he goes. So the the poem started with he went to a wedding, mm. like reception, and he stopped someone, and then started telling his story what really happened. Mm -hmm. So I think like the way like we teach politics, I mean, part of me kind of do those things to stop people on a street in a like community gathering and try to tell that what's going on around us, the world, the politics, mm -hmm. the big picture. I'm an academic. My job is university. But I think that our job is everywhere. Yeah, we go. We have to stop people and talk to them. I mean, like recently, I I went to this wedding ceremony and I was sitting with a criminal lawyer. <laughs> so he has got totally different perspective about his understanding about society, hmm. about migrants, about the refugees, about the people who like lazy, don't want to work, and you know, and the and his his idea about taxation and all those things. I mean. I was not angry with him. I was just trying to understand, like, what's going on in his life, in his understanding about these things. So he has got a very strict view about, you know, crime and punishment. So that he thinks that crime is just, you know, people just criminal. Mm -hmm. But my understanding about crime is crime is just social construct. It came from all kinds of things, like deprivation, this mm -hmm. not there. So what you can do, I mean, so, so I was like... I'm not sure like I was saddened, but I was a bit unnerved because when people like, you know, high position, like, you know, lawyer, you know, because they deal with lots of big institutes. Mm -hmm. and when they had this preconceived idea about other, I mean, that's quite, I mean, I, I don't know, like, I mean, how, and I try to like the whole evening i was trying to convince him with my political understanding about all of those things i did not convince him on anything but uh, part of me did you see the drive that i really want to tell this thing this example this story and and perhaps it will not do anything to him but perhaps he might remember like you know a bit of words a bit of sentence what i say i mean um so I'm not sure like it's a, it's a kind of I can I kind of see it as a kind of artist in a different way. He yeah, actually go to every week, you know, even like we sell pepper <laughs> in the town center about mm -hmm. you know anti war and all those things. I mean there's not many people come to us. Like there's like one particular Saturday we are selling peppers about anti war, you know, and mm -hmm. and at the same time within like I think 20 feet away from us, there's a recruitment going on by Ministry of Defense. Yeah. They brought, yeah, yeah. The, they, they brought I think, the a tank as well to show, you know, the what they can do, you know, the power. I remember these things are all it's part of a Scottish summer, you know, that you find, you know, there's the, the army dog teams, you know, just doing their display at the local fair and all this kind of stuff. You know, it's they're very, very astute about how to how to how to show themselves in communities, but again, I I I go back to my grandfather. He didn't have any choices. He didn't have very many choices, you know. And mm -hmm. the army was well, you know, presumably did an engineering apprenticeship somewhere. But then the army seemed to be, you know, the rational choice, you know. And that that's, mm -hmm. you know, it's hardly that it's hardly that now, but. You know, that, that seems, that, that's the tradition that, you know, it's following on. Mm. And you can see the difference, how the communities were gathering there. So they are 
camp is like totally full, lots of fanfare, lots of, you know, all those color and then noises and the, and, and the music, um, you know, the patriotism and all those things. Uh, and us, like four or five people, we are like some kind of poor heart we are like <laughs> dealing with and hardly anyone kind of came to us. Uh, but at the same time, we did not feel bad about that. We, f- we felt that we had to be there. If you're not there, then, you know, there'd be nothing. Well, it's, I, I think that there's an interesting, you know, crossover with, if you like, some of the Christians involved in the anti-war movement, because this idea of witnessing, mm. whether you actually can objectively do anything to make change or not, this mm. idea that you're there witnessing and being as part of a kind of, if you like, a conscience can can be really important. Mm. And I don't know. I mean, there's always this. I keep thinking. I come back to this, you know, kind of phrase that you use a. It's one of these cliches, but there's a truth to it. If, it, if you don't believe in anything, if if you if you believe in nothing, then you then you'll believe in anything. And so many people. I, I, the thing that really distresses me that a lot of a lot of people in the arts go to the anti-vaccine direction, you know, because a kind of seventies distrust of the state was not actually replaced by any sense of belief in a real community. It was all a kind of mm. fantasy community, really. Mm. Mm. And that, yeah, and, and and you know the kind of whole anti-vaccine thing is always oh, just mm. another aspect of the state, and it's not. Mm, you know, mm. it's like the idea that the, that the state is that could be some. I mean, the, the, what the Tories have done is actually made it very clear that the state is not going to do you any favors ever. And so, some of the vax, the anti-vaccine people have come to the wrong conclusions from that—that that the state is congenitally incapable and is 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 against you at all times. Mm. I mean, that, that could be interesting. I mean, and, and that pose. And how does the left deal with that? Mm. I saw like you are quite interested about the themes like progress um mm. so it's 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 a quite a kind of you know, crossroad of our humanity like the you know, progress is suddenly is something else the progress suddenly becoming like a fantasy and and there are insider yeah but the, the idea that progress is something that we can agree on and that is a good thing those mm. things are now becoming you know very very tricky mm. and if you like, maybe maybe the word progress should be seen as a piece of rhetoric rather than anything real, and mm. maybe it always has been. Mm. Mm. I mean, I, th- th- there are some some thinking. I don't know if if, the, if people people on the left have heard much. Of the, do you know Bruno Latour? No, no. A really, really interesting kind of thinker about you know philosophy, creative practice, and ecology, and. I've been looking a lot more at. Mm. He's something that has caught my attention, you know, over the last few years, and I haven't read the, the most deeply on it. I mean, there are apocalyptic kind of ecology writers, you know, who say, well, mm. you know, what does it matter if we all die, basically? But I mean, the Bruno Latour is more that how do we actually give voice to the non human? to actually make sure that it's not just, you know, the interests of the greediest humans that, you know, come Mm. into discourse. And I find that persuasive and interesting. And Mm. it doesn't mean to say that, you know, you go to, you know, political meetings pretending to be trees, you know. Mm. It's actually, Mm. how do we effectively Mm. bring, uh, how do we decenter that it's all about, you know, human need and that automatically then just devolves down to what Mm -hmm. the biggest corporations need you know Mm -hmm. and i find that really he's been a really interesting writer that way and Mm -hmm. he's he was involved in a big project at a place called zkm in germany about you know working with artists and creative groups to think about some of these matters Mm -hmm. and again it's i think artists on their own is like people will go and see a bit of art which is fine but Mm. then to actually i think artists have to work with other experts they have to work with publics and they Mm. have to try and understand the place and then get people to think about what if this place was different what would it be to you Mm. Mm. and you know 
you know, quite often I've I've, I've done projects on places like um, atomic energy, atomic research mm -hmm. establishments, which are the it's essentially dreamlike places now because we we can't actually re-enter the the men the mindset of how it was to be there, but mm -hmm. we can kind of imagine ourselves into them as it were. But I think what one of the research things I was actually proudest of was a thing where we went to North Norfolk. Mm -hmm. which is a very Brexity part of Britain. And it's there's all these interesting things going on there about, you know, rich people are buying up all the villages on the coast and poorer people are being forced inland. So and we tried to think about how we could work with people to describe some of these processes and film it. And it's all to do with, coast, you know, first of all, we thought talking about climate change doesn't make any sense without talking about coastal and social change because they're all bound together and the second thing was that everyone was well aware of all the received images the things like you know the pictures of polar bears and the pictures of graphs of you know um, temperatures near them everyone's actually used to those images and it doesn't actually work to show people these images because it just it, people are get access that you're you're just trying to lecture to them mm. what we did was we actually began to, we took this different perspective and we asked people, what is your coast going to sound like in the area, in the area of coastal change? And that, that was actually, a so people, people, they see an image, they go, yes, that's right, or no, that's not right. But you hear a sound of nature, or you hear a sound of a voice from the archive telling you about what the 1953 floods were like in their village, and you start to develop new record. You do field recordings with the children. The children imagine they do little radio plays. Then you get their parents, and then you do some oral history with them. Mm -hmm. Then they they start to tell you about what what they think about the future and the fears of the place and what's important. And then you get mm -hmm. all these people who are like the experts. You know, we are the national ornithology group. We are the national trust. And these people. They all claim to be speaking for the landscape, but they're excellent at talking past each other rather than with each other. But when you get people together on a series of events where you're working on sound, and then we had some events where people started to make music together in the communities. Mm. So out of all this, there was a film made, which actually, in, in a sense, actually made me learn a lot because with this film, instead of, images supported by the sound it was the opposite way around you wanted the images to get people into a, 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 a more calm state of reflection and attentiveness to what they were hearing mm. so that was actually a really interesting exercise and so sometimes our assumptions about mm. you know, okay we make a documentary and it's going to be like this and then this will have such and such an effect mm. I think that that can often be we're misleading ourselves when we do that. And mm. I'm I think art can actually I learned a lot from doing that. And we're, mm. we're hoping to do similar projects again, just going in for more funding, etc. Mm. Mm. But uh, that way of thinking, you know, where art gives a, pl a space mm. for listening and making Mm. So having conversation, I, I think is I think it's it's what I liked about it so much. Mm. I mean, I'm I, I think I can relate like some of the things you were saying, uh, the 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 noise of the waves, noise of the coastal areas. There's like something, something perhaps spiritual even. It's like something very natural, organic, um, and I think when people. Actually, people actually kind of sense it, which one is not like the real one. And then if it is not real one, I think there's a kind of sense of loss there in in our existence. I mean, I, I, I was born in Bangladesh and I was born in, like you, in a like capital city. Um, and our coastal is like far away from us. Mm -hmm. And I still remember it's not easy to go there. So during that time, I was like, you know, 15, 16, the first time I went to see like Bay of Bengal, 
And so it is the longest beach in the world. Mm -hmm. And it was just absolutely beautiful. And then, you no, know, going to like the wave, the sound, the first time I'm listening, mm -hmm. that memory is still there. That like kind of idea about Nirvana, the paradise, mm -hmm. <laughs> La Perouse, I mean, um, and like, because obviously time changed. So that longest beach, the organic beach, now a kind of marketplace for rich people. There are hundreds mm. and thousands of resorts, thousands of hotels, five-star hotels. And when I saw those pictures, I don't see like this is my <laughs> memory. Yeah. It's nothing to yeah. do with me. So uh, what I got is like sense of loss. Mm -hmm. And it's, I think something is there that when you have this sense of loss, you feel bad, you feel sad, you feel, I don't know, like melancholy. I know. It's, I think there's something about the seeming inevitability of, of, of money. But yeah, it, it's, it's a tough mm -hmm. one right now. I mean, we we found that you know, I mean, in in this village, you know, people had lived there, you know, and you know, forced out. They would still come as much as they could, but mm. you know, the, the idea and 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 again, Blakeney, the particular village, there, there was a housing trust that was set up so that you know, people could buy, you know, that the trust would buy houses and rent it to 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 villagers. But of course, nobody was ready for the colossal tidal wave of buying money you know you, you know and this year that the economy would become about accumulating property i mean that, that that's all that's all the british economy is now isn't it really mm, mm, kind of mm, sad mm, mm. yeah so like i mean in terms of visual part like i mean I, like when someone says that i'm a visual artist i mean what does it entail like how many things are involved here so you mentioned about photography, the video, and like, what else? How big is it, this visual, visual art? Well, everyone, everyone talks about the death of painting, but the patient's not dead yet. It just refuses to die. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it, it's kind of, I mean, visual art, it's quite interesting. There are people who set up encounters you know, rather than actually make, you know, anything as, you know, they're, they're talking about what do you, if you make a commodity, is mm. that same as being an artist? And for some people, some people come through art school and out the other side, and it's about deepening a skill, and they do, you know, that thing for the rest of their lives. Mm. Some people, you know, the idea that you have this kind of flexible approach to what is collaboration and what is dealing with people. So sometimes you produce stuff on your own and sometimes with others. Mm. Um, artists, I think, I mean, I could easily have been a geographer. Mm. You know, I, 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 I feel that's a really important part of, um, you know, art is about understanding place for, mm. for me. I mean, for other people, again, that's not, that's not so important. Mm. Um, I'm not really... It's 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 a bit like asking what is mathematics. Isn't it? <laughs> huge, huge area. I mean, I, I I do I don't I think it's too easy to say that art is about creativity and you mm. know individualism. I mean, individualism is important, but you know, mm. you have to be. I mean, you, you you have to understand how to how to communicate into the world and. Mm. I think that this is so, this is something that you know schools don't teach very well. You know, mm -hmm. uh, artists here are the skills, and look, I've I've, I've done the proper cross hatching on this drawing, so therefore that's what I need to need to do. So, our school is about all the stuff beyond that, at least as much mm -hmm. as deepening the technical skills. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it, it's kind of weird, you know. Why would why would a, a television company want to take on somebody come out of an art school rather than somebody mm. who's done a, a more technical training? And mm. I think it's to do with having a kind of rounded opinion and a rounded sense of what the scope of something is. Mm. I mean, 
I'll, I'll, I use the analogy that suppose it's the middle of the night, you know, you're doing an edit and the, the film has got to be on the desk at nine o'clock tomorrow morning. And, you know, the, the, there's a huge row going on, the director of photography and the direct, you know, the director and the editor can't agree on anything. And you're there and they turn around and say, well, what do you think? And you, you can't say to them, oh, I don't know. I just I just did the sound. It's like there has to be. Uh, art is about ways of finding ways of sharing language, I think. Mm, mm. I mean that sounds very abstract, and it doesn't. I, I think it's. I think. I think art. Art is about ways of sharing language as people, and I know that sounds big, yeah. but I, 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 I can't. I can't think of a better example. I used to be much more dogmatic, but I can't find a better way of uh, expressing it anymore. Mm. Like I mean, my experience with that is I'm. I'm a big. I'm a big art fan. One thing I noticed that the art, the the you know those famous arts. They're so elitist. Basically, you know, you have to pay a serious amount of money to see those exhibitions. Yeah. So when you talk about the community, the sense of community, the connecting people, the the normal average people have got no access to those to those great That's arts. That's true. That's true, sadly. I mean, um, there are places like DCA does have things that are reasonably, you know, good money. Uh, sorry, you know, their their visual arts act is actually free, mm. which is good. Mm. I, I I've tried to think about what does it mean when you see these companies sponsor these huge exhibitions and yet they're still that expensive. And I asked Laura coming about it, you know, and she she's a she's an arts writer, and she was just saying the amount of insurance that has to be paid. For some of these huge exhibitions, is there's a lot of stuff that's that, that's invisible to the public, you know, in terms of these places. But I, I I fully agree that one of the problems is that if the model is that art is a place that people come together to express awe and wonder, if if you go along with the thing that art is what's replaced religion, mm. then, you know, extract as much money as you like from from your devotees, you know. <laughs> I mean, there are ways, you know, that pe people do get to see some of the stuff, and uh, some of the most of the best um, exhibition places they they have, you know, like you know some a couple of days a week where you don't have to pay things like that, and I don't think enough of these pe places are imaginative enough to do that. Mm -hmm. But more more of them should be. But you know, it, it used to, it, it used to be fairly common that that would actually happen. Mm. And God, when I lived in London and had no money whatsoever, I used to know exactly which days what, what you could go and see what. <laughs> but yeah, maybe they just don't advertise that stuff as much. But mm. in a sense, these blockbuster exhibitions are actually, if you like, part of part of city tourism, at, at least as much as mm. anything else. So it's sitting in between city tourism and a substitute for religion and education is a very tricky place to be. Hmm. And you know, I might get into trouble, but I think that the VNA have had tr trouble trying to balance the different things because hmm. they, they they want to do you know they want to be part of the city's great vision. They want it to be like everyone talks about the hmm. Guggenheim Bilbao, yeah. Hmm. But in a sense, that was the all, all the cities want to have an instantly recognizable snapshot thing that you can come to, you know. So. Hmm. It needs to do that, and it was going to have a lot more research kind of side with the art school, but you know there is some of that. But in a sense, Dundee's great problem is that if you're over, if 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 you're if you can, if where you live can't be seen from the waterfront, then you're not really going to get that much improvement. Mm. Mm. And again, the, the Eden Project sitting alongside at the old gasworks, that's not going to improve very much either, you know, mm. over the back. But then how do you, it's a case of the visibility of some parts of Dundee and the invisibility of the rest has always been. And I know, the, I met John Alexander, the the the, the, the city, uh, the, the, the council leader, and I think he's a decent man. But how how to actually move things to the, the side of Dundee where it's invisible or how to engage the side of Dundee that's not seen from the waterfront with what's going on. I mean, that, that is a, I'm not an urban planner. I, don't, I think that's one of the big problems in the city. 
Mm. And the problem is if you do that, then what we got is just like gentrification of like, you know, you town. And 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 then basically you don't want any poor people around this, you know, nice, sleek art galleries. Um mm. and you want the tourists to come over, you know, because they bring money. The V and E have done a few things. They've got rid of that. You can actually just go in and sit in the in, in yeah. the bottom bit and relax there. They've got rid of that cafe which was London prices and it meant you couldn't actually come in and sit and relax and talk to people mm. you know which I think was actually a good move you know mm. so it, it, they're doing the, yeah there, there are small things and, and that that's that's I think that's to be encouraged I think the new director there has got a head on for some of this stuff but it, I think it just, it's just been a bit slow to actually start up mm. a couple of other things because I'm aware yeah. of my time and your time as well um because you are a creative person. And with me, like, we have to write stuff as well, like, in our subject areas. Uh, but your area is, like, much more creative, much more. So you need space, time, all kinds of things there. Um, sometimes you have this, like, creative blocks as well. So you cannot just do, like, things. I mean, um, tell us those things about, you know, how to deal with those things, like, for future artists. Oof, that's that's a huge area. Um, <laughs> or just like tell your experience when you have got this you no know, creative block. There are times you just have to, you know, absorb what's around you. And there, there, there's a famous piece of the famous little quote, which is either by Sister Carita Kent or by John Cage. They couldn't both have written it at the same time. And it's um Remember that um, thinking and making are different processes and don't do them at the same time. Mm -hmm. And th 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 This is something that I, I tell students, and I think it's quite important that you have to be in a state where you can surprise yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's actually quite difficult because, you know, you don't want to just write, today I'm going to do exactly this, and then you produce exactly that. You know, that's if you like, that's that, that, that that's that's got well, some people do that, obviously. Mm. I mean, you know, that's if you like how craft works, you know. Mm. I think, in, in terms of the way I work, it's I mean, I gotta say, this has been a really tough year because I've had it's been incre incredibly stressful. That I've had a very, very difficult um, uh, third year this year to to, to cope with, and I. I have felt very down about it, to be honest, and uh, mm. feeling that there's no time. Mm. But the answer is that I have to get better at looking after my own time and protecting my own thinking time. And I think we are, all of us in the university mm. have to actually, you know, there's a constant encroachment of, oh, just another little thing, you know. And, you know, it goes on and on. I can see your expression here. <laughs> you know exactly what I mean. It's the same everywhere. Mm. But, uh yeah. And it's 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 about allowing that space and not getting anxious that things are have to be done by such and such a time, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, there is that art is about space and time, and you know these things that you just mentioned, and we want to get the students to actually think that it's about that. And mm -hmm. in a sense, I think one of the the key things in the art school is to get people to realise that it's not about passing the modules; it's about what kind of person you are becoming. Mm. I think, in fact, that probably applies across the, you know, the, the humanities just, at least as much. Mm. You know, mm. if you if you are becoming an interesting, thoughtful, and reflective person, then you will pass the modules. Yeah. You know, rather than saying pass the modules and then you'll become this thing, it, you, I think people have it the wrong way around. Mm. But there is also something about have some low stakes things happening as well as the big projects. Mm. You know, because you never know when a little thing will become a big thing. Like that Bell's project became really quite, mm. quite huge. You know, and I, I'm just really delighted by it. Mm. Mm. Um, sometimes, you know, you, you you think, oh, here's an opportunity. You look at the opportunity. You realize how much money is available for the opportunity. Mm. You think about how many hours is it going to take me to do this. And what is there not payment for? And sometimes you think, well, that's not an opportunity. Mm. 
deciding not to do things is actually yeah. at least as important as deciding what you will do. Mm. Mm. I mm. mean, our, visual arts has grown into this ecology where a lot of museums and public galleries are free. And so, in a sense, the, the, val the amount of time people put in to make things isn't necessarily valued in, in, in the payments that any of those institutions can actually make. But then everyone who works in those institutions is getting paid. Mm -hmm. I mean, thinking about how much work gets it goes into you know a show that's at DCA and how much mm -hmm. the actual artist's fee is. Yeah. It's not as high as you'd imagine. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we're not in it for the money. It's as simple as that. But <laughs> unless you look after yourself a bit, then you know you you're just going to be flogging yourself for mm. you know unrealistically. Mm. So mm. there are a lot of students who think, oh, I'll do a few projects for nothing, and then there's this famous kind of idea that oh, it'll look good on your CV. Mm. Well, how old how how old are you going to be when you think? Well, I don't need an improved CV. I need some I need some income. Thank you very much. <laughs> so the, 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 that's not necessarily the kind of noble creative thoughts but these are the actual thoughts that you actually have mm. to be realistic about to get to the noble creative thoughts mm. Mm. because I mean if you look at the all those famous artists historically I mean they're all more or less sponsored by their patrons yeah Rich patrons, I mean, um, so that's yeah, like, or the church. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, now, America has arch patronage. Britain has very little. Mm, mm. And what there is, you know, we're also, you know, tense about being seen to be, you know, accepting the money. For example, there's this thing called the Freelands Foundation, which mm. is quite big in the arts, and it's run by Elizabeth Murdoch. And so, you know, if anyone accepts any money from that, they're, you know, disgraceful. But mm. is there is there clean money at all? I mean, <laughs> it, it, you know, I, I'm not, I, I, I'm unlikely to be offered any money by them, but uh, <laughs> I don't know. Um, is, is the idea that, you know, artists have to kind of be role models mm. in this sense, is, is it actually practical? Mm. Given mm. given how little you know value is actually put on artist production, mm. Mm. like especially my experience with my daughter is, um, her life is quite expensive because she has to buy lots of materials, art materials. Yeah. What I found that modern art, modern you know modern art studies or this kind of field, is quite expensive. Quite expensive. Uh, the shops are quite expensive as well i mean the, I, I was quite surprised that you know like in in like some field like in our field like if you want the book you can buy it from ebay second and third and but for the art i think you need products which has to materials be yeah <laughs> and and these are expensive products i mean why like you know why these things are quite you know lots of barriers like if if you if you come from a very poor background, it will be very difficult to you know, because you need those equipments. Yeah. Without I mean, that, I mean, what you can produce? I mean, I mean, without money, there there was this whole whole thing called arte povera, which was a came out of Ital Italian art in the nineteen forties, late forties and fifties, and it was art made from poverty and from very very tiny things and. Mm. Again, that, that you, can, you can point to artists like Kurt Schwitters, who was a, a German artist who, who was exiled, he became an exile in uh, in the Lake District, and his his materials are everyday materials. A lot of artists work oh. with the materials of everyday life. This, you know, we can cer certainly you know talk about you know art, art from everyday life as being at least as important as you know luxury consumer art, but. You know, a lot, a lot of paints, it, 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 and a lot of things like that. They are think, they are, you know, thinking about will this paint last two hundred years? Will this color be fast? You know, there, the, there is a lot of, you know, kind of original research and in, 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 into some of this. Mm -hmm. And 
You know, people, uh, there's this uh, French painter, Yves Klein, who, th who couldn't get a blue enough blue and basically went to one of the great paint makers and made it with this paint maker. So, you know, take out everything, take out everything except the binder and the pigment, and that's what I want. And it's the most extraordinary colour. So oh engagement God. with the material of production is quite rare amongst artists, but there's no reason why it should be. Mm -hmm. So there are artists who also never touch a brush. They never, you know, touch paint. There are people who do pieces of work in the land. You know, the, yeah. the, the, land, the land artists, for example, uh, there was an artist called Agnes Dennis who did a piece called Wheatfield, a confrontation. And it was all about organising and politics. And it was in just under the Twin Towers, at a place called Battery Park in Manhattan. She, when there was going to be a, a development, she, she grew a large wheat field in the middle of New York. And this was all about a confrontation between urban and rural. Well, again, was it really rural? Because it was industrial scale, you know, wheat field in a mm. bit of Manhattan. So thinking about how this can happen. Mm. And as Alan Sonfist did a thing called the Timescape, where there was a tiny bit of Manhattan block where he returned this piece of, of Manhattan to the vegetation that it would have had before, um, you know, before the Dutch settled New Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. So all these artists, you know, they, 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 if you know, people give conceptual art a bad name, but mm -hmm. if it's actually carried through rigorously, it, it, it can appeal directly to the imagination. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I, I think I think that a lot of that end of work, you know, land and environmental art has got a lot mm -hmm. more going for it than, mm -hmm. you know, you, that, that you might think. And, and there was a great course at Glasgow School of Art called the Environmental Arts degree. And it's now more or less integrated with sculpture. But for a long time, it was trying to get people to make art in the world where they were with what they could find. And some of the great kind of artists that came out of Scotland, you mm. know, in that period came out of that course. Mm. There mm. was Claire Barclay, Jackie Donaghy, um, Roddy Buchanan, Douglas Gordon, mm. Ross Sinclair. The whole va th this course somehow produced a, an enormous kind of group of really, really interesting people mm. Mm. who are still... And the interesting thing is they're all very loyal with each other mm. and they all, you know, support each other as well. And sometimes students, I, th I think the students come out of an art school and they're, I think it's changing now. You're getting lots more mm. students working more collectively and, you know, working mm. as groups and less, in, less competitively individualistic. And I think that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. I'll just give you like one example. I mean, you, you are an artist. You might, like my nephew lives in Glasgow and he has got a urban flat. So he, he's got a good job there. He lives mm -hmm. there. And he was telling me this story about that one night uh, he went to his kitchen, light switch on, and suddenly he found like two snails in the sink. He was horrified. Mm -hmm. It was like this urban setting, you know, this uh, plush flat. I mean, where the hell the snails came from? So he was furious, and and then he more or less tried to get get rid of them, and um, and then I try to tell a kind of my own commentary about the whole thing is that why you were so angry because why you are not thinking of it's the other way around because these habitat were theirs, we mm. invaded them rather than they are invading us. And my nephew said, I never thought that way. And and suddenly his brain's th thought process just changed. And mm -hmm. then he felt more compassion for snails. Nice one, yeah. <laughs> well, that's the kind of, you know, way that they, I, I think we can do, that people can come into situations and, you know, just hold a mirror to it, slightly different perspective. And I think, that, mm. I think that's what art's for, you know. It's, mm. You know, there's pleasure, there's humor there's ambiguity there's there's mm. fun but i think the best of it is actually allowing people to see things differently and what change mm. could look like or, or feel mm. like or how mm. they could talk with each other differently mm -hmm.
but but also this idea about you know ownership who owns what there's lots of confusion there understanding about that ownership that we own this land like mm. from home who's the original owner you know? why yeah. they're coming here i mean so so i think the politics history and the understanding about community it, it, what you say there earlier the idea of this like you know one nation one community it just mm. makes a myth and like fantasy um yeah. and you can see that countries who are trying to build wall and everything they're afraid of other people who will harm them but if you look at the history of that particular country you'll see that they actually harmed the other people mm. more oh, yeah. <laughs> like one of the th- thing i was like really thinking of you know which is linked with like visual the our understanding about you know society politics um so this idea about ownership and the idea about you know safe secure um uh, and the idea about for home um so the recent thing going on in uk's politics is about migration refugees and suddenly this government created this like huge barge and tried to put mm, yeah i know about that immigrants on that barge i mean with me like it kind of the i'm like more worried about this like visual presentation of the whole thing like as an artist what what do you think like why they are doing this i mean well i don't think they actually care if it happens or not i think they are talking to an increasingly small group of people i mean i did read somewhere that 9% of the british publication think that immigration is a top priority the trouble is they they are they are so mired that they can't do anything else i i think they'd be quite happy if they could just keep showing the pictures of this thing and 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 and, and that look you know we have you know this 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 is what's going to happen to people and i don't i don't i don't think they actually have a policy i mean now nobody can go on it because of what is it legionnaire's disease so yeah. I I think we are living in I think the situation is that the, you know the idea of the politics of the spectacle is mm. actually you know quite quite interesting in a sense the idea that they had was that this kind of imaginary illusory world of pleasures and delights would seduce people from their true self interest but they they couldn't I don't think they could they could never have imagined the sort of inversion of of this that you know the actual expression of horror and something disgusting and hatreds for mm-hmm. for your for humanity would actually be what would motivate i don't mm-hmm. think anyone could have seen that in the 60s that the you know, the idea that you know the spectacle was actually advertising and the glittering things that you could never afford but you would nonetheless identify with you know mm. the idea that it would actually be the opposite that you'd be fed you know images of horror and decapitation mm. and contempt for your human being and that that would actually be what would feed politics that you know is there's i think it is it's quite roman isn't it mm. Mm. it's a bit it's, I mean, mind you, how many romans attended the coliseum though when you think about it that was a that was a, probably a minority interest as well although mm. how can we know mm. But the but the spectacle has to be there that you no know, they're keeping countries safe they're keeping the empire safe. And... I don't think any. Well, I, I I don't I think I think the, the the production of imagery has actually lost track of its purpose now for the government. I mean they're I think they're so hopeless they they, they they're just pumping stuff out without any any focus whatsoever. Hmm. Hmm. Anyway, that's. I mean, I mean that's that's yeah. So I think I think that's. that's that's the good comment you made that i mean at the end it's like showing more like hollowness of the whole thing yeah and, that's and true think... so they think it's doing them some good but it's it, it's it's just eventually mm. they're, 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 i mean they they have run out of road completely you know they have got mm. no ideas so mm. yeah mm. i don't know labor aren't going to do it <laughs> not, not at the moment anyway Well, I mean, in a sense, I don't really see why. I don't see how politics is actually going to going to work for a while. I think it. Mm-hmm. I remember I was talking to a friend of mine about 
he's Portuguese, and I was going, how long did Portugal get to take to get over its empire? And he said it still hasn't, and that's four hundred years ago. So I think I think sadly Britain's got a long way to go to get over its sense that we are special in the world. I think the last point has to be you know this rise of AI, so this artificial intelligence. Um, what's what's your view? Are you optimistic about this rise? Or you see are... The people are uh, using it, and so clearly not. But there, there's, a, there's a few interesting artists thinking about it. There's somebody called Boris Eskildsen, who's, uh, I think he's based in Berlin. He did this extraordinary piece where he put something in for a large photo prize. It won the photo prize, and then he told them that uh, I didn't actually make it. And so this caused a huge, you know, kind of, you know, scandal. And but what was very interesting was that he'd worked with this set of digital prompts, and it showed basically it looked like it had some of the elements of an August Sander portrait. And August Sander was one of the great German portrait photographers of the nineteen thirties through to the to the the fifties, and actually even earlier than that. But anyway, mm. he it had some of these qualities. It got the hands right which is quite unusual for AI. But also it had some deliberate thing that looked like deliberate little photo flaws, the kind of distortion you get when you get a slightly kinked uh, a, a sheet film in, in the developing. You know, I had a couple, and it was very, very photographic indeed. And it looked like a mother and daughter. Mm. In that, and it had this kind of interesting relation between the two, which is actually something, I mean, most AI artists, do me, you know, an enchanted castle in a landscape and put a dragon in, you know. But <laughs> it's moved way beyond that. It's moved way beyond that. And he's written a lot about it, and he's somebody I'd recommend you have a look at. I mean, again, you know, if if the world is about jobs and saving money on employing people, then it's a bad thing. But interestingly, one of, one of the students in second year that I saw, she did this really interesting thing where... She took, you know, there were a lot of um, witch burnings in Scotland in the in the sixteenth and you know mainly the sixteenth and seventeenth centuries, and she started to put descriptions of these into uh, AI uh, setups, and it, it, then she'd put in descriptions of particular places, and it produced these very extraordinary images, which oh my God. Are, are clearly not real but yet have realness about them. There's this famous phrase that about, about Trump, wasn't there, that it wasn't truthful, but it had truthiness. Mm. And then this kind mm. of fake, fake exact... And I, I was very interested by what she'd actually done. Wow. And so there are, you know, people right from, you know, kind of international artist level down, you know, into, you know, people working in the art school right now, who started to do some really interesting things. One student, I can't remember her name, produced an entire book, you know, printed a book, as you know, and, and it was a professional quality book as her um as her third year work, you know, and it was all artificially generated images, but it still needed editing, it still needed, you know, con contextualizing. So mm. students are using it, and well, let's see how it goes. Final question is, um, I think it's like more kind of visual imaginary. Like, um, so if you're if you're asked to invite a dinner, and you are given this opportunity to invite three historical or contemporary artists or whoever it is, you think that that will be the ideal dinner for you? The things you do, the things you enjoy. The things you you know cherish. Uh, who are those three persons? But I, I I did not talk about this thing before with you, so well, no, it's like it's like instant. Um, you have to think now at this moment. Not that no. you have to give me a minute there. Take your time. Oh. One of them would be Federico Fellini. Oh my God! <laughs> yes, I, mean, I love his film. Oh my yeah, God! Yeah, yeah, very unfashionable these days, but extraordinary. Mm. Okay, that's good. <laughs> that's one. Let me see. 
a writer. I'd like to have a writer. I'd like to have Yaroslav Hasek. Wow. He wrote The Good Soldier Speck. I heard about this, but I, I never read it. Why do you want him? Because I I don't know. The, he wrote this book, and it was a kind of... He never finished it. It's a gigantic, sprawling book about um, the craziness of, you know, Austro-Hungary building up to the war and this ordinary, you know, kind of person in it who through complete kind of guile, guileless innocence or so it appears manages to sabotage everything around him and, uh, you know, still looks all ready for the job, but, you know, has basically entirely got their, it preserves their own self, sense of self and has a, a good subversive attitude to things. It's an extraordinary book. It's a bit. Re- you, you got to get the proper version with all the swearing in because <laughs> check, check swearing. Uh, the, the 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 swearing is swearing from all over the Austro-Hungarian Empire in this book, and it's recipes as well. Wow! wow. Um, so that's that's really good. Okay, the third one, final one. Gosh. So you've got a writer and a filmmaker. Yeah, I do. I do. Tina Madotti. I don't know her. Tina yes. Madotti is a, a photographer. She is, uh, she's Mexican. Mm-hmm. And so she had her own life entirely outside, you know. Um, well, no, actually, she, she was part of, part of the, if you like, the American Western photographic tradition. But she, you know, basically did her own thing and uh, was involved in, you know, a lot of politics, you know, knew all the interesting people, you know, knew Frida Kahlo, all those people. Wow. Yeah, I think, you know, some some that's not not that well known, but, you know, so mm. interesting things. Well, 20th century people there. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. That's yeah, that, 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 that's the, come up, that, that's, that's not an easy thing. Uh, no. So absolute pleasure. I mean, you made time for me today. Um, So see you soon. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye.